Got a couple of technical questions here. This is, after all, a technical organization. Yes. Ted Maiman originally invented the laser at Hughes Research Labs, uh, but he was also working on masers. But Hughes was not interested in lasers. I think masers were invented by Charlie Cowns over at Berkeley, right? Mm -hmm. But they were interested in uh, the masers and not the lasers. What, what, why couldn't they see the light? <laughs> why couldn't they see the light? Boy, this is... But the crowd that was not attracted to begin with is getting ugly. <laughs> hey, that's, a, that's great. They could not see the light. Well, I think... <laughs> Howard Hughes... Anybody here... Well, yeah, okay. Anybody here have a... Did you have a... No, nobody here ever probably met Howard Hughes. I didn't meet him. I just happened to see him walk by one day. But... These these guys at Hughes, we were real. Uh, uh, we were some pretty tough guys. Uh, we we built some of the most uh, potent. Uh, for example, we built the first air to air guidance guided missiles and that sort of stuff. The Phoenix missile was one of those things you could shoot up high into the out above the an attack in formation, come down through them and detonate nuclear weapons and all. Oh, like oh wow. But anyway, yeah. So we we wanted big bangs for a buck. So when Ted Maiman invented the first laser, it had a little crystals maybe about a half inch long, about a quarter of an inch in diameter, and fired it, and it went Nobody at Hughes was interested in that at all. So of course, they said, Ted, you're out of here. So they said, and Ted, of course, went out the door with that uh, reaction to them, because again, he felt that he knew something that was going to be the future, and I, I thank him for that. And we all want to give, give Ted Maiman a hand. He really, he, he could have just folded. He could have just folded and laid down what he did. The guy stood up and said, I'm out of here. You guys ain't going where I'm going. But anyway, I think that the Mazer was still, the Hughes was quite interesting. It was a massive machine. Ted had already reduced, I think I'll put a few rough numbers out. Ted, Ted had reduced the size of a Mazer from something that looked like a refrigerator to something that looked like half, maybe two lunch boxes lined up together. So he had done a great job. A great, a great inventor and innovator was Ted. So uh, Hughes, of course, again was more interested in uh, the power, the power, and there was no power in a bang, a, a poop that this laser could make. However, uh, Ted was quite pleased uh, when some of us uh, were able to show uh, that this thing could really uh, do some interesting things, which we did, operating from a, a, a K-135 and out, out of Albuquerque, where we were shooting down. The, I can't remember the, the name of the missile air engagements that was operating lasers there also. So, but I think Ted brought us into the to the to the weapons age and into the higher uh, use of technology with lasers. Okay, well we could talk about weapons, but let me talk about something else involving high-powered lasers, mm -hmm. just to see uh, what you think about it. I mean, this guy down at the UC Santa. Barbara, am I right, Mike? Uh, Phil Lubin, right? Uh, Phil Lubin has this idea that, you know, you could send something to the nearest other star and, you know, the lifetime of your average engineer uh, by, you know, putting a little sail on it and sending something the size of a matchbook or something yep. and kicking it with a big big laser, <clears throat> phased up, super duper laser. What do you think of that? I mean, you've, you've been firing lasers or things in the sky. The, the power source, the general, well, a couple of things. I was asked to participate in a discussion a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, about a similar technology that we could push a one gram object to three quarters the speed of light to get it to Alpha Centauri. Once we did the we did the numbers and started looking at that, we would need a we would need probably half the energy on the Earth to get the thing up to speed. Okay, so but we said, wait a minute, that that may work if you <laughs> use light sails and other things. But I'm not sure that. We understand how to do things like that yet, and the power source is needed for that. Anybody here that has anything to add to that, that's sort of my feeble opinion, but anybody ever thought about that, those things it's like? I know, it's they're poking at it, yeah. But I think the, uh, I, I would hope that if, uh, if they could get a laser beam to acquire that. Uh, Half the power, power, I mean, it, yeah. you know, this might be the salvation of PG&E. <laughs> 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 okay. Ten cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ted Maiman's original Corad lasers were based on the use of very small synthetic ruby crystals. Yes. Where did those crystals come from, and, and how does that relate to a, dis, a strategic decision by Corad becoming a division of Union Carbide's material systems division, as they did? Right. That's right. Uh, the, uh, the first laser. For us that have seen it, uh, of course, it's quite an interesting gadget. I'll call it a gadget. 
And the crystal inside was actually a crystal that Ted, as I understand it, uh, uh, purchased from overseas from the uh, Switzerland or someplace where you have these rubies made for watches. These guys made these, made these nice rubies. So uh, Ted um, got one from them. And of course, uh, it was the towns and those guys thought they had the idea too. But they, they reported, I think for all of us that have read the story, towns reported these types of lasers couldn't be pumped with enough energy to get anything out of them. There was too, there was too much inefficiency in, these, inefficiency in these things. Well, uh, somehow Ted got this thing to go and a little poop, a little, little pip pip, and it did something. But again, Lindy then came to us and said, hey, look, you're a, you're a subsidiary. Corad was a subsidiary, a subsidiary of, of Union Carbide, right? So they said, look, why don't we team up? So I think that brought together the crystal products. And of course, we were able to work hands in hands. And, but one thing was very important. We also had a crystal growth lab right at Corad there in Santa Monica. We, we, we had uh, Dr. Pasteur and some of the guys there from HRL, Hughes Research Labs, that came along with Ted, that really was starting to look at some very new techniques of, uh, I can't remember all the phrases, the terms used for the methods, Sikorsky, those types of things. Uh, but they were starting to experiment with some crystals, and we had a chance to fire those crystals up. And again, we worked hand in hand with Lindy and Union Carbide to actually develop some real efficient uh, ruby crystals, the largest being, uh, if I recollect very, very quickly for a laser for the Army, was a, was a amplifier, amplified multi-stage system that developed uh, a three, 300 joules, uh, the largest laser we'd ever put together in those days. But it had like a 12 by four, 12, 14 inches long by three or four inches in diameter crystals. And we took this thing to Fort Monmouth to show it to the Army. They took one look at it, and I swear to God, the guy said, don't fire that thing in here. They cut it up in a little small piece and distribute it all over the country to different research labs. But anyway, yeah, Lindy and us worked, worked together. So, so these, these ruby crystals were coming from Switzerland? Is that what you said? The initial one. The initial little guy that Ted got the first little peep out of came from there. You know, uh, there was a mention earlier about, without actually naming the country, that the first planets around... Uh, Another ordinary star were found by the Swiss, found by astronomers in Switzerland. And uh, I, I asked one of them, that one of the guys, why Switzerland? If you think of the countries that do astronomy, yeah, they're all seafaring countries, yeah. or at least were, right? Well, Switzerland. I mean, what? They don't need navigation from the heavens. They really need navigation to cross Lake Geneva. So I asked, <laughs> I, I, I asked this guy. I said, why do you guys have, even have observatories? And you know what his answer was? The watch industry. Exactly that. He said. You know, we make these really expensive watches, and they needed observatories to make sure the, the, the watches actually kept good time. The accuracy of that. It's, it's something a, useful for your next cocktail party. Yeah, we can use that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, during the 50s and the 1960s, a lot of military work was being done by the Americans, obviously the Soviets, and other nations to develop ray guns and death rays. Once again, Buck Rogers. Uh, in the hopes of using modern science to fight battles with energy beams. Now, before CORAD was selected for the Apollo 11 Lure Science, Lure, L-U-R-E, even though it's laser, what is it, it's, what, what's the, yeah, Lunar Laser Range, ranging, that's L-L-R-E, but I guess that's harder to pronounce, yeah. Back in those days, those guys were good for all Okay, all right, in any case, for, for that project, what were some of the specific applications being developed for the use of weapons-grade lasers to fight against satellites, spy planes, cameras in the sky? You, you kind of alluded to that. We, we had to, uh, you know, the Cold War did play a role with, uh, with CORAD and, and along with other, other companies also. We were the first to build lasers that were used on the battlefield in Vietnam. For example, we built uh, illuminators that were flown in the uh, Pop the Magic Dragon for us, and maybe some veterans here from that, that, that era. Uh, we put uh, a laser illuminator, and one of my guys was actually in the Vietnam for about six months there operating those lasers from... Uh, a C-135 or something like that. But uh, we were trying to break up the, uh, the, 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 the night operations on the, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so our mission was to go there and just circle the uh, area where of interest was taking place and illuminate that with uh, these uh, lasers from the, from the aircraft. And of course, once we uh, spotted them and they couldn't see us, of course, <laughs> uh, we could then bring in the heavy guys that load, unloaded down there to try to break that up. The, the Ho Chi Minh Trail became such a, 
uh, a factor in both the Cambodia War and in Vietnam. So we put lasers out there to try to disrupt that. I think we were successful as far as the point goes. We, I don't, you know, we all recognize what happened as an outcome of the war. But however, we did it, uh, present on the battlefield the first laser technologies used uh, in, in the Vietnam War. Anything you want to say about uh, the future of space-based laser weaponry? Um, I, 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 someone asked maybe, me once. Maybe you can't say it. No, I no. I, yeah, someone asked me once, how did you feel watching Apollo 11 take off? I'll go back there for a moment. I said, I felt like, good, you know, we, we were just, uh, you know, like, you know feel like we, we were like dads waiting there for the, a baby to be born, you know, one of those things. And that feeling, you know what I mean, guys and ladies? Because for us, if that didn't make it, we weren't going to be able to shoot. Well, that was, you know, it would all be down. Well, when I was asked about that, that, so they said, did you ever have another feeling like that? I said, yeah. It's when our M1 Abram main battle tanks rolled into Baghdad. I was sitting there hoping that they, the first one wouldn't go down because I had helped develop the fire control system and that thing. So I had to really sit there and say, good heavens, whatever happens, don't let the first one get blown up anyway. No, but I think weapons and lasers and electro-optic systems will become a, a part of the future. Um, laser, the debris problem. We, I think it, who hasn't here had a thought in your own mind, for example, folks, about how can we solve that? Can you raise your hand if you've had a thought like that? It's a massive problem. If we're encasing ourselves in, this, in, the, in the world, although there's big gaps in this thing, but we're encasing ourselves now in a real uh, barrier of debris. And you and I know if you get struck by something moving at 18,000, 17,000 miles an hour, it ain't going to be fun. I happen to have a, a dear friend, uh, Bernard Harris, first African-American to walk in space. He had to actually climb out on the uh, robotic arm when he was on that mission. And of course, his mission was to go out on the arm. He's a physical doctor. Go out on the arm and experience the exposure of the human body to the space and the spaces that they had at that particular time. Now, Bernard tells this as, as, as one of his lovely stories. He walks out, he's like, the, 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 the arm lifts him out into space on the sh from the a bay, a shuttle bay, and he said immediately his hands felt like they were ice cubes. Now, of course, he wasn't supposed to say, I, I give up and quick come back. His job was to stay out there until some decisions could be made about the whole apparatus that he was testing. So I'm just trying to say to us, that uh, guys, we, people have to go out and expose themselves. And of course, on that mission, their windshield was struck by a, uh, an object. I will never know exactly what it was, but it nearly penetrated. But he said it was the loudest bang he had ever heard in his life, and he hasn't flown in space since. But that's another story, too. <laughs> but, but when we think about lasers in space, death rays, all those kind of things, uh, I think they're coming. That I think we all are aware now that there's a military element of the space pro, uh, what, space, uh, space force. Space force. Oh, sorry, I was say space, space force. I think that uh, a young man at a, at a conference a few weeks ago asked me about space force. I said, the military has always been in space. Sputnik was a military satellite, a large more military operation. Uh, our, our guys, Von Braun and those guys, want to put us up. Put us up. You know, it's, it's always been there. We get excited when we hear about this, but it's. Am I right about this? Well, it's always been military. It just it just wasn't painted with that. But it, that was the underlying. Yeah, that was the, sort of the underlying current of all of that. Well, of course, SpaceX and Elon Musk is a dear friend of mine. Those guys are trying to now put this over into this new era arena of uh, capitalism and commercialization, but. What's Elon riding on? Technology transfer, he got off the, yeah, okay. So I think that we, we want to recognize that this has always been a part of our technological space adventure, its military applications relative to use in commercial field, and we'll see more of it. Now, weapons in space, <clears throat> I can't talk about that too much. I'm aware of some things that there's going on now, but they are they're there. Al, we want to go to uh, the audience for questions. Before we do, let me ask you just one last question here. And that is, when you're sitting at a restaurant sometime and, you know, people find out that you were the guy that fired this laser at the moon, uh, allowed us to measure its precision. I think today the precision is, you know, a couple of millimeters below a millimeter, whatever it is, right? Yeah, it's incredibly, incredibly accurate. Yeah. And they say, so what? Yeah. Right? 
you know, who cares? I mean, I, you're not measuring the distance to Trenton, New Jersey to that accuracy. So why do, you, why, why do I care, since I'm going to pay for this kind of stuff, why do I care about measuring the distance to the moon that accurately? Well, as you all probably know, we, we experienced a 7.1 recently down in L.A. I'm very interested for the guys to continue to use uh, lunar ranging technologies and those things to develop possibly earthquake uh, prediction concepts or methods. So, of course, that's a very personal thing, but I, I felt a 7.1. It, it ruined my day. But I, <laughs> so i like to have us be able to tell us more about those things. That's one benefit. And, of course, I think, too, that uh, uh, laser light, light is such a, phenom a, a, a phenomenon that, that is so yet to learn more about it. For example, when folk sometimes, what is light? What's light, guys? Packets, the answer kind of goes all around a lot of places. I think we need to learn more about light. I think we need to learn more about what constitutes that. Dark matter needs to be looked at much more carefully as to what that force is in the universe, things like that. So I see us trying to take those two things and put them together to get more uh, accurate uh, knowledge about the future of our traveling in space as, as, as spacefaring civilizations. Terrific. So, so Seth and Hal, this is Brian from the back. Just want to make sure there, there's some details about the experiment that I don't think we've really totally addressed. For example, there, there's on the screen we've got uh, five students from Wesleyan University who were brought in who yeah. helped with the uh, ranging experiment. This is the actual CORAD laser in at Lick Observatory that was used for that. Could you talk a little bit about like working with those students and just just the whole process because there's there's a lot that that actually went in until you actually made that first measurement. Well, the, 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 the first measurement, of course, happened after a number of incidents, as we've spoken about today while we were there at Lick. <laughs> one, of them was kind of a, one of them was kind of a funny one. We, we were firing a laser and looking for the initial returns on the first night or two. And, of course, the, we were scratching our heads, why don't we see something? And as we learned later that we weren't uh, timing out because we were maybe 100 meters away from the place that we thought Lick Observatory was. So Joe and those kind of guys sorted that out for us. And that helped us to get a, a window open that, that we could finally see the laser pulse. This guy here, I want to raise your hand, Joe, please. Just wave your hand. Joe, those kind of guys made those decisions for us at Lick. I was just a guy on the button to get the beam out. But when all of us were a team together really working to make this happen. But again, the, the laser's job there was to put a beam out that could, of course, uh, had, a, had the, we were running what's called a TEM00 mode, a very uh, tight form, tight form, diffraction limited type of beam. Because again, when you're trying to fire over that distance, you do not want the beam to get so broken up, because you can get that spot, that broken spot, or right over the reflector, you'll never see it. And of course, those types of hot spots that you could possibly develop with a laser like this could also damage the reflector there at the observatory, which again would have been a big no-no. But anyway, what we did, and you can just see uh, the gentleman at the back with the black and white striped shirt on, uh, those, he's standing in, standing in front of the laser rail. That's about a seven-foot rail. And we have the oscillator section back there. That's those two dot devices, blue devices at the back. And that's the oscillator. And, of course, we go through some coupling optics there to put the beam up into the amplifier forward here. So we put uh, five or 6,000 joules into that back section to get about a, about a, a megawatt of power out of it. And then we pushed, pushed that into this amplifier. We put maybe 10, 20,000 joules into that amplifier to pump that up to uh, uh, 12, 10 or 12 watt, 10 or 12 joules of energy output. And this again was coupled into the, tele the eyepiece telescope of Joe and those guys did that and out into the, uh, out into the telescope. Uh -huh. Now the power supply is, but that I was operating wasn't down in the, in the uh, what we call the basement or the pool. We were up on the main floor. So I could only know something was wrong once I heard a problem happen. But anyway, <laughs> that did happen a couple of times. So I lost a couple of uh, power supply elements there in a big explosion that shook us all up for a few moments. <clears throat> but when you're discharging that type of energy, it's not a pop that you hear, it's a pretty big bang. So, <laughs> so we got that fixed and got back in operation within a day or two and went on then to uh, be able to, su to successfully find the reflector. Yeah. What, what was the size of the spot on the moon once you were using the uh, we, were, we were coming from the output of that, the, the, the forward blue unit there. That was three quarters of an inch or so, coupled up through the telescope in the three, three meters and so forth. But at the surface, it was about a couple of kilometers. A uh, couple of kilometers. So yes. it would be easy to miss the reflector. Uh, if, if that, again, I wanted to make that point. If we couldn't keep a very uniform beam, 
See, my job there was to keep a very uniform beam on the surface. Because if you had a beam that had distortions and those types of uh, issues, then if the reflector could be sitting in one of those, you'll never see it. So that's the, that was one of the problems we were trying to keep, keep under control. Brian, there's, I know that... Uh, there's also one other interesting thing. Can we see the capacitors in this? Because you said it took about a minute for those capacitors to charge up for you yes. to do each. Are uh, those visible in this picture? Those, we, we were using, uh, what well, this goes back way back to the old days. We were using castor oil fill capacitors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple of heads shaking here. <laughs> I, I think they, we, they were rated five, five kilowatts at a, a couple of microphones, whatever the way, yeah, something like that. But they were fairly large units, about as big as our monitor there, but they weighed over 100 pounds. They were something like eight or 10 inches square and about maybe a couple of three, four feet tall. And of course they were, uh, made a big boom when something went wrong. But we took us, uh, it took us 30 to 45 seconds to recharge those, which limited my operating time to just one shot uh, per minute. But we're, we, could, we could get away with that. This slide that's up on the screen right now is interesting because this is the, the official declaration to the International Astronomical Union of the success of the event. And it's my understanding that this was a private telegram that only became public about uh, five or six weeks ago. And so it just, it's, it's the actual official declaration that yes, we, we were successful with this and kind of the declaration to the world of the success. Mm -hmm. So it's, it has historical relevance. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, Brian, if uh, you have no objections, I guess we'll go to sure. questions from the audience. So here's your chance. There are some microphones up here, and I assume that they're operational. So if you can come up to the microphone, that will help.